To tell the story of Gwyn's children is to tell the story of Gwyn himself, for his children were all born to fulfill a purpose. Gwyn's first daughter, Guinevere, was a maternal figure cherished by all. She was born to soothe the kingdom after a period of intense war against the dragons. Gwyn's son, Gwyndolin, was a master of illusion. After Guinevere fled the failing kingdom in fear, it was Gwyndolin who disguised the fading of the light. And finally, Gwyn's youngest daughter, Filianor, was truly a product of her father's pride, for as long as she slumbered, Gwyn's world would not end. But there was a fourth child, a nameless king erased from history, the god of war, Gwyn's firstborn son. The first war ever fought was the War for Disparity, a war for the right to flesh and blood, where before there was only stone, a war for the right to the surface, where before there was only the below, a war for the right to a beginning and to an end, for before there was neither. The everlasting dragons were to be introduced to the concept of the end, and it was Gwyn's firstborn son, like his brothers and his sisters to come, who was divinely conceived for this purpose. So it was that the son's eldest born inherited the lightning from his father, along with this powerful predisposition for war and arms. His weapon was an ingenious sword spear that leveraged the user's own body weight, allowing it to be trodden remarkably deep into tough dragonhide. This was the earliest form of what would become the cross spear, which went on to inspire the legendary weapon wielded by the dragon slayer Ornstein, who was, unsurprisingly, anointed the first knight to the Nameless King himself. The Nameless King also wore an attire woven of sharp dragon scales, as they were themselves impervious to fire, and it seems that the best tools against the dragons were taken from the dragons themselves, a philosophy that another legendary figure, Havel, clearly took to heart, as the man cased himself in stone and took a legendary dragon tooth as his weapon. Havel too not only served the Nameless King in the war, but also his first knight Ornstein as well, becoming the third member of a legendary trio of dragon slayers, who would eventually come to inspire the miraculous tale known as Sacred Oath. And so, it was with strength, courage, cunning, and unity that the war for disparity was won. The dragons shall never be forgotten. We knights fought valiantly, but for every one of them, we lost three score of our own. Exhilaration, pride, hatred, rage. The dragons teased out our dearest emotions. Thou will understand one day. Me? There's very little to be said. What good is a dog with no hairs to hunt? But I'm lucky to be alive, I suppose. With the war won, these lords were the first to face an uncomfortable truth, that their glory, much like that of the dragons, would not last forever. The everlasting dragons were vulnerable now, and were forced to adapt to this unfamiliar and hostile world. So they gave birth, and slowly began to mutate and deviate in their evolution. Wyverns, serpents, man-serpents and basilisks, the imperfect, the crossbreeds and the wretches, dragons that spit fire, lightning, poison and corrosion, some even caught the undead curse. And so it was that despite Gwyn's best efforts, dragons and their kin lived on, some as unchanged as ever. Rumour it may be, but I have heard of a surviving ancient dragon who resides in this land. A coterie of undead serves the dragon, as they train to become dragons themselves. Sounds unlikely, but you never know, do you? As the gods really should have known, faith always finds a way. And ironically, it was the gods and not the dragons who failed to adapt. A war had been fought in the name of disparity, but Gwyn's Age of Fire was nothing of the sort. Darkness was the enemy now, and Gwyn would do anything to prevent his Age of Fire from ending. 
anything. So how righteous, truly, could their war against the ancient, unchanging dragons have been when Gwyn himself refused to cede to the natural order? Thus began the betrayal of Gwyn's firstborn son, his god of war, who allied with the remaining ancient dragons. Shamed by his firstborn's betrayal, enraged at his disobedience, and driven by that famous desire to erase all that opposed him, Gwyn disowned his firstborn son. His royal blood was denied. His legacy was expunged from the annals of history, and the altars of his worship were smashed beyond recognition. His name was lost forever, but as the gods ought to know, faith always finds a way. And the Nameless King had some faithful knights indeed. Look within the rubble of these statues. Look amidst the traces of the Nameless King's foot wrappings, his braces, his attire, and you might just spy a familiar cross-spear design belonging to the Firstborn's first knight, the Dragon Slayer Ornstein. In the dragonless age that followed the Nameless King's betrayal, Ornstein was assigned to guard the Grand Cathedral, and for the captain of the Four Knights of Gwyn, this must have been a lowly role indeed. As he wasn't even guarding Gwyn's daughter, he was guarding an illusion. Nor was he alongside his fellow knights. Instead, he was partnered with Executioner Smo, a cannibal and a glutton, someone who could never call himself Ornstein's equal. So as his fellow knights faded away, as Gwyn burned to cinder for his age, Ornstein eventually left the ruined cathedral and abandoned his post in order to search for the nameless king that he once served. Funnily enough, Smo, of all people, was the last knight of Gwyn to remain at his post. We know this for, after defeating Aldrich, we can purchase his armor, which implies that Smo, the cannibal, may well have been cannibalized himself. An ironic twist of fate that Ornstein was lucky to avoid. And we don't know exactly where or for how long Ornstein set off in search of his nameless king. But if one attempted to trace his path, one would find evidence of the influence that these two men may well have left upon the world. In Ferossa, for example, we witness an order of lion knights with armor blessed by a certain war god. Even more curiously, the figure depicted on their helmet stands his own against a dragon. In the drowned ruins of Hade, there's a being who aspires to the great legacy of the old dragon slayer. So is this Ornstein himself? Probably not. Though, how curious is it that a man inspired by a dragon slayer would be allied with the dragons that are right outside his gate? The world was changing. And, in truth, those who aspire to conquer dragons overwhelmingly end up with them as their allies. Look to our nameless king, who was born for a war against them, only to ally with the vestiges of their race. Look to Vendrick, who inherited Gwyn's legacy, yet aspired to recreate their power. Look to the kingdom of Lothric, whose knights were originally hunters of dragons yet they ended up taming them and fighting at their side. Look at Prince Rickard, who fought in a stronghold filled with serpents and ended up being summoned as their champion at Archdragon Peak. Look to Havel, who adopted a spine of stone and a dragon's tooth only to uphold a sacred oath with their nameless king. And finally, look to Ornstein, the dragon slayer, who, laden with duties and oaths, decided that the only one that would matter was his pledge to Gwyn's exiled son. And so it was that the way of the dragon led him to the Nameless King's stronghold. In the years after his exile, the Nameless King had tamed a storm drake, upon which he had led a lifetime of battle. Eventually, he settled here upon Archdragon Peak. This, it appears, was a place where dragons and their kin could worship and live in peace. It was only a matter of time, after all, until Gwyn's Age of Fire would burn down to ash, and dragons, as we know, have both time and patience in abundance. Alas, an unkindled would eventually find his way here to Archdragon Peak, driven by this 
unstoppable desire to claim the strength of a war god, and to claim the strength of his ancient companions, so that Gwyn's Age of Fire could finally be brought to an end. For war is supposed to be waged for what we believe in, not to erase our opposition from existence.